Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Dr. Bob. This is where you ask me, Dr. Bob Gebe, the Chief Scientific and Medical Officer here at the American Diabetes Association, your questions about diabetes. And uh, for those of you that have been watching this, uh, this is our fourth year already, hard to believe, and we'll be doing some new things this year, which I'll tell you about later. But let one of the things we, we do is we, we pick a theme. Uh, and and because we just published the standards of care in diabetes, uh, that's going to be our theme. And so, let me let me start with a question: Is what are the standards of care? So, um, the American Diabetes Association every year publishes. Uh, this exhaustive, um, it's almost like a textbook of diabetes. They're, they're guidelines for healthcare professionals about what is the latest and greatest science and what does that mean in terms of recommendations for care in diabetes. And so um, it, it is a big process just to give you an insight uh, under the hood of what it takes to do this. So we each year, we look at all of the papers published in diabetes the year before and, and match them against all of the recommendations that we have and then bring all of that information to this incredible group called the Professional Practice Committee. This is a group of interprofessional healthcare um, brilliant people from various different parts of the diabetes world. So yes, endocrinologists, adult, pediatrics, but kidney specialists, heart specialists, uh, diabetes educators, dietitians, uh, uh, psychologists, really a little thing. Uh, and they scour through this and they discuss and they uh, uh, eventually argue at times on the recommendations until they come to a consensus. And that's what we publish. Uh, and these are really the the, the globally recognized guidelines for diabetes care. They're accessed over 2 million times uh, by healthcare professionals. There's an app. You might see your healthcare professional looking on their phone at the app and looking something up and making sure that they're giving you the best care possible. And, and so let's talk about what's in it. Um, and and how this is important for you to know. And so the the first the next question is, uh, do, do the standards of care you know cover updates for all types of diabetes? And yes, it does. So for type one diabetes, type two diabetes, diabetes during pregnancy, uh, really the whole gamut. And for uh, younger people and the pediatric age, for young adults. Uh, for the general population, and also for older adults. There are sections about all of these different groups. So it really covers everything. Um, it's, it's quite an amazing document. Um, so uh, the big question is, what are the key updates? And you know, again, I said this is like a 300-page document, so there's a lot of new stuff, but I'm going to try to hit. Uh, you know some some of the big headlines like what's new this year and 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 I think there there are two that I'm going to start with and and that's around cardiovascular disease and obesity so what's new in cardiovascular disease you know this is so important because if if you think about it you know the number one cause of death for people living with diabetes is cardiovascular disease. And so that is something that is super important that we uh, uh, do the best we can to reduce the, the risk of cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes. So two things that I'm going to tell you in cardiovascular disease that are brand new. And one is screening for heart failure. So it turns out that there are uh, blood tests, uh, BNP or pro-BNP are the name of the blood tests. And they can, they can tell if somebody, uh, even without symptoms, is at risk for heart failure. Uh, and therefore what things need to be done uh, to prevent that from happening. So if you are a, a person with diabetes uh, and have risk factors for heart failure, high blood pressure, cholesterol, other cardiovascular disease, um, ask your healthcare professional if this blood test, the BNP, is something that um, they, that they should order for you because that's part of the recommendations. So I said there are two things in cardiovascular disease. What is the second? 
it's about something called peripheral arterial disease. So this is where the arteries uh, typically in the legs uh, can get clogged. Uh, and that can lead to symptoms like claudication, pain with walking that is relieved with rest. And, and we know that this is a cause for amputations. And amputations, unlike most complications of diabetes that have been getting better, the number of amputations are rising. And so it's very important that we identify people with peripheral arterial disease. And so with that as background, what are the new recommendations? And that is, if you're over 50 years old and you have some other complication of diabetes, you should be considered for screening for peripheral arterial disease. And what's that screening test? Um, it's called an ankyl brachial index, ABI, ankyl brachial index. And what is that? It's simply measuring blood pressure at the ankle and at the arm and comparing them. And, and that's a test that your healthcare professional could or order. So if you're over 50 and you have risk factors, uh, smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, those types of things, uh, then you should ask your healthcare professional if uh, an ABI, an ankyl brachial index is something that they should get for you. So that's, the, that's one of the recommendations. And the other is if you've had diabetes for over 10 years, it might be worth getting that, that test also. So bring this to your healthcare professional. This is the cutting edge. You now know what they are uh, uh, just being exposed to because this just got released. So what's new in the standards of care? Uh, I said two big areas, one cardiovascular disease and the other is obesity. Well, there's been so much happening in the world of obesity in the last year. And, uh, you know, we, we know that lifestyle continues to be important and we emphasize some strategies around lifestyle. And we may do a separate uh, session of Ask Dr. Bob to get into that uh, more deeply. The other recommendation is that when it comes to medications for obesity, uh, there are two first-line medicines before really the, the two most recommended medicines, and that is semaglutide and terzepatide. Uh, you may know them by a number of different brand names. Uh, uh, Ozempic uh, or Wigovi is brand names for semaglutide. Uh, and for terzepatide, um, we have uh, uh, Monjaro as the recommend as as the brand name. So those are the first line drugs if you if if someone is going to be treated with medications. Uh, the other recommendation about obesity uh, is that body mass index, which is a calculation based on your your height and your weight. Uh, and it gives you a number, a BMI number. You may have sometimes seen it as that. And that's what we use to define whether someone is considered overweight or having obesity. Uh, and the recommendations this year are to say, that's a great thing to calculate, but you should also consider some other measurements. Uh, a waist to hip ratio, the, 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 the diameter of your waist versus your hip, or just your waist, what your waist size is, can be another important measure of obesity. And so that's the recommendation there. So two big uh, uh, headlines out of the standards of care, cardiovascular disease and obesity. Uh, so the next question is, well, how about type one diabetes? What's new there? And I, th I think there, there are a couple of things I wanna share, uh, actually three things. So let's do it. Uh, first, there are some recommendations because many times, and this may have happened to you, people with type 1 diabetes, particularly as adults, are misdiagnosed and thought to have type 2 because type 2 diabetes is more common. Well, uh, we give some recommendations for healthcare professionals how to sort out whether someone has type 1 or type 2 so that they don't get uh, misdiagnosed. So that's, that's recommendation one. Recommendation two is about the staging. Uh, so <clears throat> turns out that there are stages of type one diabetes. Uh, what are those stages? Well, stage one is when 
you uh, have normal blood glucose, uh, but you have these special antibodies that are predictive of developing diabetes. Uh, and, and so if you have those antibodies, but your blood glucose is normal, you're in stage one. Stage two is when you have those antibodies, two of those antibodies, and your glucose levels are not normal, but they're not high enough to say you have diabetes. So that's that intermediate zone, stage two. And I'm going to talk about stage two in a moment because that's important to call that out. And then stage three is, is what we think of as type one diabetes. Your blood glucoses are elevated. You're high enough to have uh, be diagnosed with frank type one diabetes and um, and and that's what we sort of always been talking about is type one diabetes. So stage one, stage two, stage three. So why is it important? Well, for stage two diabetes, we now have a treatment that if we find that people have stage two diabetes, meaning that they have antibodies and their glucoses are abnormal, but not enough to say they have diabetes, there's a new medication uh, called teplizumab at uh, CED is the brand name, and it's been shown and approved by the FDA to delay the development of type 1 diabetes. And so you might have antibodies, someone may have the antibodies, but not have frank type 1 diabetes, and this can forestall the development of type 1 diabetes and their need for insulin. So those are the recommendations around type 1 diabetes. As I said, the standards of care are just chock full of information and lots of recommendations. So uh, there, there are a couple of other that I want to throw out. And this, this is uh, a question, you know, what, what, are, what about other complications or issues of diabetes? Is there something new on that? And there is. And, and this is what I want you to be aware of. And, and that's about bone health. So here's something most people don't know, that people with type 1 diabetes have uh, a, a four-fold increased risk of fractures. Four-fold, they're a much higher risk of uh, having fractures, hip fractures being the, the sort of most common. And people with type 2 diabetes are also at higher risk, about 50% about higher risk of fractures. So because of that increased risk of fractures, the recommendation is if you're 65 or older, you should get a, a test called a bone mineral density, a DEXA test. Um, and that's something that your healthcare professional can uh, order for you. Uh, again, if you're over 65, you should bring that to their attention uh, that, and ask them if you should have a bone mineral density test. Um, and sometimes if you're less than 65, but you have other risk factors, for osteoporosis, uh, like a family member with it, uh, it may be also appropriate for you to have that test done. So bone health is, is sort of the, the, the new issue to be thinking about along with sort of the things that we typically think about in terms of uh, preventing complications. So the next question was, what about lifestyle changes and anything new there? And, and yeah, I want to I want to talk about three things. The first is there's a there's a whole section on on how to manage religious fasting. Uh, there are a number of cases where fasting is is a part of someone's religion, and we want to help them do that safely. And there are guidelines specifically on how to do that. Uh, the second is that we want uh, healthcare professionals to screen uh, people with diabetes for their fear of hypoglycemia uh, and ask questions about that because that can help influence the what is the best treatment for them. And, and then the last thing is there are some recommendations about promoting good sleep because we know that either too little or too much sleep uh, can worsen diabetes, and therefore it's important to help people um, identify if they have sleep problems, and also what are the sleep routines that can help them get good sleep. 
So more to come on that, but that's uh, that's an important issue. If you are having issues with sleep, you should talk to your healthcare professional about it. Okay, let me round out the last thing, and this is always a subject that people are interested in. And the question here is, in this year's standards of care, anything addressing technology? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we can't be talking about diabetes without thinking about technology these days. Um, and so first, it's um, we're really recommending that healthcare professionals should also be all be very comfortable uh, and proficient in working with diabetes technology and specifically continuous glucose monitors. That's something that is here to stay. It's an important part of diabetes management. And we want to make sure that healthcare professionals are uh, um, understanding of how to use that information that comes from a continuous glucose monitor. And we have training programs to help them uh, become proficient. Um, the the second is that, you know, we hear about uh, um, AI a lot, artificial intelligence. So it turns out that uh, when you get a, a retinal photograph, a photograph of the back of your eye, which can be done by healthcare professionals in different settings, uh, they can now be read uh, effectively uh, by AI. And there are actually some FDA-approved artificial intelligence readings of these retinal photographs. And so you may be getting those, so it's good to know. Um, and then the, the, the last thing I'll say about technology is really recommending now technology use early in the course of diabetes. So someone newly diagnosed with type one diabetes, don't need to wait before we offer a continuous glucose monitor or insulin pump or automated insulin delivery. Think about that early on. And so if you're newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, uh, uh, you should ask about whether some of these technologies are right for you. So I covered a lot of ground today in the standards of care. Uh, uh, Please spread the word if this is helpful and you know other people that this information would be useful for. And the question always comes up, where can I find out more? Well, the entire standards of care, uh, as well as an app, uh, as well as a, uh, a, a, a webinar on it, is all available free to your healthcare professionals and feel free to suggest it to them. But you may want to look at it. I, I, I'll just tell you it's not written. Uh, for uh, uh, sort of lay people. It has a lot of technical language. So uh, sorry about that. We are working on a version that would be specific to people living with diabetes. So stay tuned to that. But all of that's available uh, uh, at no charge uh, at the American Diabetes Association website. So look for the standards of care there. And so with that, uh, Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for our next episode uh, next month. Uh, please spread the word. If this has been helpful, um, follow me on LinkedIn, on, on Facebook, because I post lots of other things that can be helpful for you to live healthy with your diabetes. And stay tuned for the changes uh, in 2024 to the format of Ask Dr. Bob. So be well and take care.